to Arizona to preach the gospel. And it's certainly a great privilege, I deem it, to be here tonight. When he said we were here Sunday night, and he said it, uh, that he had his prayer meeting on Tuesday night, and I said, well, I'll just come over and have a little fellowship with you at prayer meeting. So this is a grand time. Glad to see Brother Williams, Brother Sonmore, and my associate friends, Brother Softman, many of them here, that people that I know personally, having a wonderful time in the Lord. We're going from here down to Tucson now, and then Sunday night is the healing service. You people from Tucson, Brother Norman there, and some Assembly of God Church down there. What is the name of it, Brother Norman? Central Assembly, Central Assembly of God at Tucson. <laughs> have a preaching service there Sunday morning and Sunday night is the healing service go to pray for the sick at uh, the service then we go on to California and back east again up in the, to the Yukon or British Columbia back and we're trusting that God will give us great success and bless you all here I was listening to that choir I just can't get off my mind you know I, I like that what it is is Real good old-fashioned Pentecostal singing. Amen. Oh, my. I, I do. makes me nervous when I hear a, an overtrained voice. You know, somebody trying to sing, it's, uh, you know, turned blue in the face and holding some kind of a high octave or what they call it, and they're not singing, they just want to be heard. But I think there's nothing better than just a real good old Pentecostal filled group with their hands up singing to the glory of God. I like that. And it does something to you. Paul said, if I sing, I sing in the Spirit. So that's right. What? We want to do everything in the Spirit. If you're singing, talking, preaching, whatever you do, it, do it in the Spirit. And that's always right. Now, we preachers know that not all the time you can preach in the Spirit, like Brother Moore said his little boy David, Brother Jack was here with us Sunday night and brought a great message to us as a builder. And he said little David kept saying when he's about seven or eight years old, said, Pappy, I want to preach. Well, he said one night, said he took him up on a platform and set him in the, on the chair and said, he said, well, folks, said David's been wanting to preach, so I suppose to just let him preach a little while. Said he sat there like an old clergyman, you know, in this little bow town. Said he jumped down out of the chair and run up to the pulpit like he was going to burn the place down, you know. Said he stopped, and looked so depleted, and looked all around. Said it just won't work. And went back and sat down again. <laughs> <clears throat> we ministers know a lot of times it just don't work. <laughs> <coughs> he said, never been able to get him in a pulpit since then. <coughs> but I enjoyed that singing so much. The Spirit get a hold of you. I got two little girls at home. One of them's pretty good size now. It's about, I guess, it's been about four or five years ago. My little Rebecca was quite young then, and about eight. Little Sarah was about four. I'd been out on meetings, and they're daddy's little girls. I, we all feel that way, our children. And so they were waiting for me to come home, and Mama you told them I'd be home about, about midnight, she thought, but they tried and stay up, but they got too sleepy and had to go to bed. I got in about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd just been out several services, and I was tired, and as many of you brother know how you feel then. So I couldn't rest, and I got up early about 5 o'clock, was sitting in the room, in the living room, with the, in the chair, kind of resting. All at once I heard a scramble out in the bedroom, and here come Rebecca, she, the oldest one, she woke up first. Here she comes through the room just as hard as she could, and she jumped out of straddle my lap and throwed both arms around me and began to hug me, saying, My daddy, my daddy, oh, you know how your heart swells out then. Well, she woke her little sister up, and so her, her little sister was about four years younger, and I don't know whether your children does, and I suppose they do. Mine, the younger one gets the oldest one's clothes, you know, it's the hand-me-down. And Sarah had on Rebecca's pajamas, and the feet was quite a bit too long, and 
legs is too long, and she couldn't run very good swinging them big feet like uh, rabbits, you know, with snowshoes on, trying to throw them feet running. And I just kind of thought then when I seen them running, like Rebecca, her legs was long, and she jumped right up a straddle of my legs like that, and her feet was well balanced on the floor, you know, and she was sitting there just hugging me, and oh, I love her. I thought that being the church, you know, the big churches that's been here a long time, settle down. Knows what they're talking about. Fine trained choirs, all the octaves and everything just right, you know. And I guess that's right. Octaves, that, I, I got it wrong. What notes there? What? So then little Sarah, she like a little Pentecostal group, you see. She hadn't been around very long. She wasn't trained like that, so... She started through the room and stumbling, falling. By the time she got to the door, Rebecca turned around with both arms around me and said, Sarah, my sister, I want you to know that I was here first. I was here first, and I've got all a daddy, and there's none left for you. That's what they try to tell us. <laughs> so poor little Sarah, she looked so downhearted, or little lips hung down her little brown eyes and she looked like she's about ready to cry because all of daddy was taken up there's no more left for her i winked at her and stuck one leg out and motioned to her here she come that's all she wanted just a little encouragement so she jumped up on my leg and she was kind of younger you know and her she was kind of topsy-turvy her, her her legs wouldn't hit the floor to balance her so I just tucked both arms and put around her to hold her, keep her from falling. She hugged me a little bit, and she rolled those big brown eyes, looked up at me. She said, Rebecca, my sister, I want to tell you something. <laughs> she said, it may be that you've got all of Daddy, but I want you to know one thing, Daddy's got all of me. So <laughs> <clears throat> I like to get in work. Jesus has got all of us. We may not have all the, but just so he's got all of us. Just be so completely in him till we are lost in his goodness. And that's where I can worship him in the spirit and truth. Now, just before approaching the word, and I won't keep you long. I usually get out with four hours, five, something like that, but... Tonight we'll cut part off, make it 30 minutes. <laughs> so then I've got to go right on in other revivals, and I certainly appreciate this invitation. Now, as I read the Word, if nothing else matters, the reading of the Word will do something for you. And I'm going to read one verse. It's not very much. It isn't, it isn't the size of it. It's what it is. That's what counts. And it's not the paper it's wrote on. It's what's in the Word, because God's Word is eternal. My words will fail. His words cannot fail. Mine's a man, and his is God. So if my words fail to reach the place that God has intended tonight for our gathering together, and to put something with the songs to go on, then I pray that you'll get God's Word, and it'll take the place. For it's any time that God has ever called on the scene to make a decision, and when he makes a decision, that has to forever be his same decision. Now remember, he cannot change his mind, because he's perfect. You believe God's perfect? You believe he's infinite? Certainly he's infinite. Well, if he's infinite, well, then he, he can't learn anymore. Now, we're finite, so we can just keep learning and take this back and add something more and take away. But God can't. See, he's perfect. Every decision is perfect. So you must always remember, keep your minds and hearts on his word. All oh, this is a terrible day we're living in. You know, the deceiving time is the evening time. But he promised us we'd have light in the evening time. He promised that. And as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, it's not another sun, it's the same sun that sets in the west that rose in the east. His prophet said there'd be a time, there'd be a dismal day, 
not neither night nor day, and but said in the evening time it shall be light again. So we've had that, and now the evening light of the, of the finish of the day. And now always remember that God makes a decision, it's perfect every time. So when he says anything, it must always remain that way. So that gives us confidence that we can put our trust exactly in what he says. It's the truth. Never vary from his word. Keep his word in your heart. I believe David said it hid his word in his heart. and it might not sin against it. Now, if we just remember that. Now, before we approach the word, we ought to speak to the author. Don't you think so? One time I was in Fort Wayne. I used my grammar is not very good, so I used the word of pulpit. And there was a man back behind the stage. Oh, I guess he must have way well, talked. He must have talked, Mister Webster. He said, "Brother Branham," he said, "Your grammar is poor, very poor." I said, "Yes, sir, that's right." I said, I'm raising a big family and ten children. I didn't get just a grammar school education. He said, well, that's no excuse now. I said, you're a man. I said, well, that's true too, but I'm so busy praying for the sick children and so forth that I don't have time. He said, well, that's still no excuse. He said, them people out there would appreciate more. He said, tonight I noticed you saying pulpit. He said, they'd appreciate you more if they said pulpit. Well, you know, he kind of punched me a little hard. I said, Brother, I don't mean to be arrogant, but I do want to say this. Them people out there don't care whether I say pulpit or pulpit. See? They just listen to me to tell them the truth about God and then live the right kind of life. They'll believe it. That's right. Yes, it's not the words. It's what sometimes what we say. Now, let us bow our heads. He said... I may not know the word too well, but I know the author real well. And so I think it's better to know the author sometime, don't you? Amen. Know him in the forgiveness of our sins. Now, let's approach him on those grounds that we know him, and he has forgiven us of our sins, and we approach him knowing that he'll certainly give us what we ask. Almighty God, we are approaching thee in that all-sufficient name of the Lord Jesus when he was here on earth, he said, You ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. We believe that to be sufficient. Therefore, Lord, we cannot come in our own name. We would not have an audition with you. We could not approach thee, for thou would not hear us. We could not have it in the name of our mother, our father. Neither can we have it in the name of our pastor, our deacon. Not in the name of our church or our organization. You have not promised to hear us, but you have promised that when we approached in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would hear. So we come confessing our wrongs, all of our evil doings and thinkings, and asking for our divine mercy and grace. We unmerit anything, Father. We have no merits that we could offer, but we come in His merits that He so freely gave to us and told us in His Gospels that if we would ask, we would receive. Seek, we should find. Knock, and it would be open. We believe these words to be true. Then, Lord, we approach tonight and ask that you will bless this congregation. This pastor, it's all the, the needs of the church, its deacons, its boards, the song leader, the choir, the laity, and every church and every Christian that's assembled here with us tonight. Father, we pray now that you'll bless your word and bless the songs that's being sung and answer the prayers that's been prayed. Save all the lost and heal the sick, Lord. Get glory unto thyself, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To take a text, if I should call it a text, and Jeremiah 8.22, if you'd like to mark them down. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Or is there no physician there? Why, then, is the 
health of the daughter of my people not recovered. That's a, quite a, a statement. He asks the question, why? And if I want to make, say, a text, I'd take those three little letters. Why? You know, when God makes a way for anything, makes a preparation, provides a way, and we turn it down, God's got a right to ask why. If you uh, felt led to build a church like here in Phoenix, and the people told you that they would come and attend the church, if you would build it, and you built the church and then the people didn't come, then you'd have a right to ask, why did you not come? Did I not build it according to the way that I told you I would? And I met every specification of your requirement. And now I'm asking why. If a um, man sold you a suit of clothes and he told you that the suit would not wrinkle and so much sales talk and the first time you talk it out what is all wrinkled up, you'd have to go back and ask him, why did this suit wrinkle? Why did it, you not tell me the truth about it? I would have bought a better suit, but you told me this was just what I was looking for. Then why has it did this? You've got a right to ask it. And God's got a right to ask. When he asked us, to, or makes a way for us, rather, and we do not follow that way, then he's got a right to ask why. One time there was a king, and his name was Ahazan. He was the son of Ahab and, and Jezebel. And he was a king in Israel. And he fell through the lattice of his house and hurt himself, got very sick, taking his bed to die. And instead of going out and seeking God, he sent some of his soldiers over to Echarn to require, inquire rather, of, by Beelzebub, uh, who, whether he would get well or not. Or Balaam, I believe it was, the god of Akron. He wanted to know whether he'd get well or not. Now, Elijah down the Tishbite was down in one of his little places where he is perhaps praying, and God revealed it to him that this king had done this evil. You know, God has a way of knowing the secret spots. He's got a way of revealing the secrets of the hearts of man. When he was here on earth, he could discern the very thoughts that was in the people's mind. Because he was God's Word. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, said that God's Word is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword, cutting to the sounder and even a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God can discern the thoughts of the heart, and He was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Him being the Word could discern the thoughts and secrets of the heart. How far people can get away from that sometimes. When they see it in action, they want to class it something else. But it's the Word of God living in the person discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Sometimes our associations cause us to make those mistakes. This same scripture that I was speaking of, uh, there was Jehoshaphat, a great man, a believer, and there was Ahab, a lukewarm believer. And Ahab had an axe to grind, so he set up and got Jehoshaphat, the uh, father of this king to come down and sit with him and have some fellowship. There's just one thing you cannot mix. That you cannot mix uh, oil and water together, neither can you mix sin and righteousness together. You've never seen a black-white bird or a drunk sober man. You've never seen a sinner saint, you're on one side or the other. That's what's the matter with the churches today. We're compromising too much with the world. Our Pentecostal groups compromising, getting back. 
I look at those little women up here tonight. I want to uh, thank the Lord. See those women with washed faces, not all that their makeup all over their face. I tell you, uh, little Acts two and four kind of washes you up, and makes uh, uh, puts some cosmetics on you that Max Factor knows nothing about. See their faces all lit up with the glory of God. That's what I like to see in them myself. And I believe today that our churches are letting down and kind of trying to compromise or, or act too much like the world. I was speaking Sunday afternoon down at the businessman's meeting on that, seeing, going back and reading the books, I'm just young in Pentecost, but seeing what they were and hearing the testimonies, and there's something went wrong somewhere. Somewhere something went wrong. Now, we see that the world has invited you, and you come to their banquet just like Jehoshaphat did to Ahab. And we find out while they were in this conference that Ahab finally uh, uh, showed himself what he wanted with the king of, to come down, and he wanted to go up and take a piece of land. He wasn't able to do it himself, and he had to have the king's help. But you know, when a man gets out of the will of God... Our church gets out of the will of God. Our nation gets out of the will of God. Or an individual gets out of the will of God. God's got somebody is going to tell you about it somewhere. If your pastor won't in the pulpit, there's a, a businessman's meeting or a choir singing or some way, God's going to have telling you the truth and getting you straightened out. That's He always has. Now, Jehoshaphat, being a righteous man, he said... Uh, we should inquire of the Lord whether we should do this or not. That's a good show that he had some background. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And he said, oh, sure, I've got plenty here uh, we can inquire. I've got, I've got a school down here. It's got 400 prophets, well-trained, dressed, and fed. They're uh, ecclesiastical uh, giants. So we'll stand and get them and inquire the hand of the Lord. When they come up, they begin to prophesy, and with one accord, everyone in one accord, begin to say, Go on up the Ramoth Gilead. The Lord is with you. The Lord will bring you back. And the Lord's going to give you the victory. You know, and one of them made himself a pair of horns, and he was going to, by that, he was going to, to push the aliens back. But you know, there's something, no matter how much you try to polish anything up, if it's not according to the Word of God to a Christian, it doesn't sound right. No matter how you polish it up and how pretty it's supposed to look and everything and how religious it seems to be, if it just isn't the Word, you know, Christians live on sheep food, and sheep food is the Word of God. If it just hasn't got the Word in it, it doesn't sound right. So that didn't sound just right. No matter these men was well-trained seminary students and so forth, and, but it didn't sound just right to Jehoshaphat because he didn't cooperate with the Word just right. So he said, isn't there just one more? One more when 400 with one accord is saying, go up, the Lord's with you? He said, but surely there's just one more somewhere. He said, oh yes, i got another holy roller up here. But his, he's the son of Imran, Micah, but I, I hate him. He's always saying something evil against me. Certainly. How could he say anything else? Because that was his life. He needed to be corrected. God had one man who would stand out among all of them and tell what was true. What's right or wrong? Tell it. He said... Oh, we better go get him. And he said, oh, this, oh, surely you can believe 400. He said, and they're the best. They're the best dressed and the best polished. They're the best students. And while well, there's 400 of them, how could you ask for another? And he said, but, in other words, if you just confess that I have a little feeling there's something wrong. It doesn't sound just right. So he said, well, we'll stand up and get Micah. So they sent a runner to him. He said, now, we're having a meeting. And all the clergymen are agreeing that this and this should be the thing to be done. So we want you to say the same thing that they say. 
They, that, you say the same thing they say because they're the bishops and the high members and so forth, so you must say just exactly the same thing they say. He said, as the Lord God lives, I'll only say what he puts in my mouth. <clears throat> we need more micros today, don't you think so? Just keep what the Lord God said. Let that be true. Let what God said be true, everything else a lie. He said, as the Lord liveth, I'll just say what he said. And they met him and said, now don't you disagree with any of those theologians, because you're just a small potatoes and a few in a hill. So you just be careful now, because you could get yourself in trouble. And, and uh, the associations all met together, and I'm telling you what they agree upon, you have to abide by that. But it didn't hit just right with the boy somehow. It didn't, didn't seem right to him. So when he come down there, he said, shall I go up? He said, you wait till tonight. Let me talk to the Lord. See what he says. And the next morning he said, go on up and prosper. He said, how many times? You know, even old King Ahab know that didn't sound right. Something had changed Micah's mind. He said, how, how many times do I adjure you that you tell me just what's the truth? He said, go on, but said, I've seen Israel scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Oh, then the righteous indignation of the bishop raised up and smacked him in the mouth and said, where went the Spirit of God when it went out of me? He said, I saw God sitting in heaven, all the host around him, and they were trying to uh, find out how they could get Ahab to get out there to fulfill the Word of God, because Micah was keeping himself with the Word of God so it showed his prophecy was right. Amen. In the Old Testament, they had just about two ways to test the Word of God. If a prophet prophesied, or a dreamer dreamed a dream, they took him down to the Urim Thundum. That was a breastplate. And as he told his dream or prophesied, and it did not register on the Urim Thundum, then the clamoration of lights, all supernatural, then they didn't re receive it. But if it did, they received it. Now, the Old Testament packed the Urim of Thundum. But the New Testament still has the Urim of Thundum. That's the Bible. That's right. If it isn't according to the Word, let it alone. <laughs> no matter how good it sounds, how much it sounds it will build your church up, how much it sounds if you let the ladies bob their hair and you let them wear shorts and things like that, It'll make them feel better, more on the plate, but that's not God's way of doing it. Amen. You must come back to the Word and stay with the Word, and might have it pulls a hide off, say it anyhow. Don't let, never let, uh, use the gospel for a meal ticket. That's right. I'd rather tell the truth than drink branch water and eat soda crackers and have chicken three times a day and hide behind something that wasn't right. Just tell the truth about it. Now, when we find out then that, that um, Micah know that Elijah had prophesied, and that was God's word from the prophet, that evil was coming to Ahab, so how could he bless what God had cursed? And if his prophecy or his vision was contrary to what the word was, then it was wrong. So today when we see all the fancy stuff handed out in the name of religion, just join the church and... Uh, come up and put your name on the book or pack your letter from one church to the other. That don't sound right. That don't take the place of the new birth. There's something wrong. Let the choir do what they want to and the audience do what they want to and so forth and just so they come back and say, well, they belong to this church. There's something wrong. It don't sound right. And it just doesn't register with a Christian. That's exactly right. Now, God made a way. And why didn't this king... Has us go on down and ask Elijah. Elijah come up and met him up there in the road, and he said, "Go back and tell him why does he go over to uh, the idol? Why does he go over to Akron? Is it because that there is not a prophet in Israel? Is that because there's no God in Israel that he has to go over to a heathen god?" And inquired his hand to go back and tell him he's not coming off of that bed. Now, there was a prophet. There was a God. There was a power to reveal his secrets and to tell him uh, what was going to be the outcome. It wasn't because they didn't have a God. It wasn't because they didn't have a prophet. 
is because the king's own selfishness. He didn't want to associate himself because his mother had been against all the prophets of God, been against that same prophet, and so it made him against it also. So it wasn't because they didn't have a prophet. It wasn't because they didn't have any bomb in Gilead. It's because he was too stubborn to use it. And that's what's the matter today. What makes people drink and lie and steal and commit adultery and, and do and act the way they do? It's not because we haven't got something to satisfy that. It's because that they take a substitute for the real thing. They try to hush that quench that holy thing inside of the heart. When God made a man, he gave him, he let the devil tuck his head. God chose his heart. The devil through his imagination makes him imagine anything. Gives him intellectual conceptions of the scripture, but God gets in his heart and leads him by the spirit. Makes him believe things that his intellectual don't know nothing about. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> that makes me feel a little religious when I think of that, see? <clears throat> when God gets a hold of a man, he comes into his heart. That's God's control tower. And the reason people drink, smoke, gamble, lie, steal, and carry on the way they do, they're trying to satisfy that longing in their heart. God made them that way so he could come in there and satisfy every longing that you have. But... How dare anybody to try to hush that precious thing with the things of the world? Now, that's the same thing the king did. There was plenty of God. There was plenty of fine prophet. But he just too selfish to go to this prophet. And we find out that the, he died, as the prophet said. When the man come back, he said, We met a man, and he told us to come back and tell you, Thus saith the Lord, you, you wasn't going to come off the bed. He said, what kind of looking man was he? He said he was hairy all over and he had a piece of leather about his loins and he knew that was Elijah. His sins had bound him out. It'll do it, brother. Every time. Yes, sir, it's just today as it was then. The people, the American people, are trying to find something. What they do, stay home on Wednesday night to hear some kind of a radio broadcast. Uh, we love Susie or Lucy or... Every one it is, or some of them kind of things. <clears throat> Here, Elvis Presley with his rock and roll, or something like that. Some kind of an entertainment and miss prayer meeting. It's not because that the Holy Ghost isn't just the same as it was when it was on Azusa Street. It's just the same as it was when it was in Jerusalem, A.D. 33. Oh, we've got, we've got the medicine, we've got the thing it takes to do it, but the people don't want it. How could you sell lace top shoes to the women nowadays when they pay fifty dollars for just a little something other a glass with a sunfish in the bottom of it or something this so how are you going to do it? Yet there's twice as much leather in a pair of shoes that you couldn't sell for two dollars. They'll pay fifty for something just to be in style. The people are wanting to act like the Joneses or somebody. Matching. I've always said I don't care whether my coat matches my trousers, my tie matches my shirt. I want my experience to match God's Word. That's what I want. I want an experience like they had in the Bible. And if they had it, so why can't we have it? Why would we take a substitute when the Pentecostal skies are full of genuine Holy Spirit? See? There's plenty of it. It's not because we're out. God's bountiful blessing shall never be exalted. Exhausted, rather. Could you think of a little fish out in the middle of the ocean? A little fish about a half inch long saying, Boy, I better go sparingly on this water. I might run out someday. <laughs> Why, he could never drink it. Certainly not. Could you imagine a little mouse about that long under the great garners of Egypt down there saying, Well, I better not eat just a half a grain today because I might run out before winter's over. Well, that sounds ridiculous. Why, it's a million times more than that to think you could ever I exhaust God's bountiful mercies. Why, it's untouched resources that God's got laid up for his church. The power of God is ready to spread a ball and take in the uh, man and women into the kingdom of God and give them a joy unspeakable and full of glory that no dance, whiskey, or nothing else could ever take its place. <clears throat> Certainly, God's got it. 
but it's because the people don't want it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Or is there no physician there? Then why is the daughter of my people is not recovered? It's because uh, they don't want it. Because the, the nation talking about they're going to build bomb shelters, they're going to do all these kind of things. There's only one escape, and that's upward. You can't go downward. We're down as far as we can go now. Come up. Rise up. Like the little song going up to you, strike the milky white way. And then you're on the endless stream. Just keep running. Oh, how wonderful. A doctor. You're just like a patient dying on a doctor's doorstep. And he's got the toxin in there for the patient to cure his disease. Now, if a patient sets out on the doctor's doorstep and says, Well, I've got a certain disease, and, and, uh, but the doctor's got the medicine on the inside, but I just ain't going in there. I just don't like that doctor, and I'm just not going to take his medicine. Now, you can't blame the doctor for it if he dies right on the step. Certainly not. The doctor's willing to wait on the patient. And you can't blame the toxin. He's got plenty of it in there. But... The patient, it's because the patient don't want to come in and take the toxin. That's the reason they die. And so is it today with the church. People sit right in the church and die in the pew in sin. <coughs> it's because they don't want to take God's remedy. God's cure for sin. God's got a cure for sin, a double cure. But the people don't want to take it. They die right in the church view a sinner. They die there without the Holy Ghost. There's no excuse today. The papers are full and churches on every corner. There's no excuse for it. It's the people don't want it. Now, I know it's dangerous if you've got a disease and, uh, and uh, the doctor's got a toxin for that disease and you don't go uh, get inoculated. Like smallpox, the epidemic in the land. A smallpox, if you don't go get vaccinated, you could die with them smallpox. Like the great salt vaccine now. You say you believe in divine healing and talking about medicine? Oh, yeah. God heals all sickness. Medicine don't heal no sickness. We know that. Medicine does not heal. There's no doctor who will tell you that medicine heals. Medicine cannot build tissue. It takes God to do that. Psalms 103, 3 said, I'm the Lord who heals all thy diseases. Now, you can break your arm, a doctor can set it, he can't heal it. Have a toothache, he can pull the tooth out, but he can't heal it. You got a appendix, he can remove the appendix, but can't heal where he cut. It takes God to do it. He's the physician of all. Now, we have remedies and so forth. Some lady, I might say this, some woman said to me some time ago, said, what about then, what are you going to say about penicillin for the flu? Well, I said, penicillin is like you had your house full of rats. He's eating holes everywhere. And you put out some rat poison, poison the rats. That don't patch the holes. That's right. <laughs> Penicillin only kills the germ. It doesn't patch the holes or build up the tissue that it tore down. It takes God, the healer, to do that. He's the Lord who heals all of our diseases. Certainly I believe that. And I'm thankful to God for these toxins and the salt vaccine. And it's a dangerous thing to, to not take it. The little children and things to get inoculation. What would we do without such? Now, everybody can't have faith for healing. They should, but they don't. So what would you do? You'd just have sickness and... Oh, it'd be a terrible place if we had no hospitals or things. It'd be an awful place didn't have hygiene and so forth, health clinics and what we have. We thank God for everything that we got. Every good thing cometh from God. Certainly. Now, we find out that uh, these toxins sometimes, sometimes they, they're, they're, they're not just exactly right. You know, you can take sometimes like penicillin. You can take penicillin and put it in your arm and, and sometimes it'll help you. Next time it might kill you. It, it don't work on all people the same. It, it just won't work. It's, uh, it'll help some and kill some. I was reading out long ago where there was a, a, a nurse that had been taking penicillin for years. She took a shot and died and about 15 minutes later. Penicillin killed her. And it was one dose of medicine killed my father. So uh, you have to watch about that when you go take the doctor's medicine. And their toxins are not perfect yet. 
But you know how they find that? They go, the chemist goes out and they take um, and get a bunch of stuff together and make up a bunch of herbs and so forth and poisons and mix them all together and try it on different things. And then first thing you know, when they think they've got it pretty well fixed up, you know what they do with it? They take it then and give it to a guinea pig and shoot the little guinea pig with this needle full of toxin. And if he survives it, well, then they'll give it to you and see how well you can survive or not. <laughs> you know, all people are not like guinea pigs. Some people are not made just like the guinea pig, so it'll kill one and help the other, maybe. So it's a chance to take. But I'll say one thing. There's no chance to take on God's toxin. You don't have to worry about that. He had toxin for sin because it's a double cure. It helps everyone. Now, I'll say today, they say number one killer is heart disease. I don't believe number one killer is heart disease. I believe number one killer is sin disease. That's the killer. That's unbelief. That's what's killing people. We got the best doctors we ever had, the best medicine we ever had, certainly the best hospitals we ever had, the best medicines to practice with we ever had. We got more sickness than we ever had because we got more unbelief than we ever had. <laughs> That's exactly true. So it is the number one killer. It isn't heart trouble. It's sin trouble is number one killer. Now, we find out, <coughs> pardon me, and that's right, but God's toxin, there's one time that God's toxin didn't work too good because it was on lambs. You go to the sinner, went to the altar, and went up to the priest, and you took this little lamb and you confessed his sins, and the lamb was killed, and the blood bathed his hands, and he offered up his prayers for forgiveness. But while he was holding on to that lamb and his hands being bathed with his blood and his little wool and kicking dying, the worshiper realized that that lamb was taking his place. That he should have died that death, but the lamb took his place. But what did he do? When that blood cell was broke, the spirit that was in that blood cell, which is alive, it could not come back to the believer, the worshiper. Why? Because it was the life of an animal. So the life of an animal would not coincide with the life of a human. So therefore, if he had committed adultery, he went out with the same desire he had when he come in. If he went out and stole, he went out with the same desire because that it only his conscience that he had done what was right, but the same desire was there. But it isn't so with this toxin we have today. <clears throat> when a man by faith lays his hands on Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> when a man by faith places his hands upon Jesus Christ and feels the pains of Calvary and sees what he did to save your soul. Brother, the worshiper once purged has no more conscience of sin. It's taken away from him. He's a new creature. What happens to the believer? God Almighty... Come down from heaven. The greatest thing that there is that covered all space and time. He never had a beginning and he never did begin and he never will end. But when he come down from the largest thing there was and become the smallest thing that there is, a little germ of life that was conceived in the womb of a woman called Mary. And because sin broke that blood cell and let out that Spirit of God that fell on the day of Pentecost, now the worshiper, when he puts his hand upon this lamb and receives forgiveness of his sins, the life that was in that lamb, which is God's own life, comes back to the believer and he becomes a son of God. <laughs> Sons and daughters of God. <laughs> then he's in the family of God. He's a believer. He goes out with no more conscience or desire to sin. Hebrews tells us that he doesn't desire any more sin because he's become a son of God. Now, when the people today, the reason that they don't want this, as I said Sunday, it's because that it makes them act a little different than what they're accustomed to acting. They go come to a Pentecostal church and say, well, we hear that people saying, like I was watching this boy here a while ago. My head got so wrapped up there, he didn't know where he was at. <coughs> I was watching his feet. He had one foot wrapped around the other, 
Looked to me like he'd tied himself so many knots it'd take five hours to get him out of it. But God must have tied him up there and he's right out on his seat again. So I thought, oh my, how I like to be lost in the Spirit like that and worship in the power and praises of God until you're carried into a dimension that you know nothing about. I like that. Carried away in the Spirit of God. Then I noticed that man, people, a stranger come in and look and say, oh my, what do you know about that? If you was only in that place with them just for a few minutes, you'd never want none of this other no more. But they, they, they try to duplicate them. They can't take it out of the Word. So they try to duplicate the new birth. They say the new birth is when you come up and say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I take Him to be my Savior. That's not a birth. A great minister in my country brought a magazine over not long ago and he said, Billy, I want to ask you something. He said, here's so-and-so and went on talking. He said, and you got hooked up now with the Holy Rollers and said, now, <clears throat> I hear you talking, you're the new birth. He said, don't you think we have the new birth? They believe they have the re- new birth when they believe. But I said, how much different that is from Paul's teaching? And Paul said in Galatians 1.80, if an angel from heaven taught anything else, let him be accursed. And Paul asked them in Acts 19, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? <laughs> Not when you believe, but since you have believed. Now, the thing of it is that they're trying to dodge that new birth. They, they, they got too much prestige. They got too much head knowledge. Whenever you get to a place that you feel you're just a little better than somebody else, when you get to a place that you think it's your stand in life, is this a little higher than the other one? You ain't going to get it anyhow. That's right. But there's one thing about the new birth. It'll make a tuxedo suit and a pair of overhauls put their arms around one another and call each other brother. It'll make a gingham dress and a silk dress put their arms around one another and call each other sister. Whenever you really get down to business with God. That's right. Just like an old darkie down in the south one time, he said, he was happy and he said, I got heartfelt religion, he said to his boss. And he said, uh, oh, there's no such a thing as heartfelt religion. He said, you just made one mistake, boss. There's no such thing as heartfelt religion as far as you know. See? <laughs> and that's right. Then people don't know what heartfelt religion is. They, they don't know. They, they have never touched it. They say they can't keep from drinking. They can't keep from smoking. They've never touched the toxin yet. They never tried it. They don't know what it'll do for you until you once get it. Then when you've got it, you know something happened. When you got it, you was there. You know all about it. You've been inoculated and things are different then. You become a new creature in Christ. Amen. One day the old boss said to him, said, I like to get some of that heartfelt religion. He said, anytime you want it, boss. And he said, one day it come a rain. He said, well, it's raining today, Mose. I guess we can, uh, I like getting that heartfelt religion. It makes you so happy and singing all the time. He said, come on, boss. And he went over there and he went out into the barn and he said, to Bob, he said, now here's a nice place here on the hay. We can kneel down and get here. He said, no, you don't get it here, Bob. He said, well, we go over to the car and crib. So they went over to the car and crib. It's a nice, dry place, not raining. Nice, you know, the, go to sleep with the rain pattern on the roof. He said, but boss, you don't get it here. He said, Moses, where do you get it? He said, follow me. <clears throat> he went well, out to hit the pig pen, raised up his trouser legs as far as he could and started walking out of the mud like that. He said, come on, boss. He said, where are you going? He said, yes, well, you get it right out here. He said, I, 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 I don't want it out there. He said, I don't want to get it out there. He said, if you don't want it out here, come on these terms. I ain't going to get it at all. So that's just the way it is. If you can't come to God's terms, you won't get it anyhow. <laughs> You've got to come to God's terms. The dodge a new birth. Like I said the other day, the, new, the birth is a mess. I don't care where you go. If it's in a pig pen, it's a mess. If it's in the haystack, it's a mess. Or if it's in a... A pink decorated hospital room is still a mess, any kind of a birth. And the new birth is a mess too, and it'll make a mess out of you. But you'll certainly get new life and be a new creature when you receive it. It'll make you do things that you wouldn't think you'd do. Yes, sir, it'll make you down there on the altar and bawl and cry and beat and confess all your sins, and, and it'll make a different person out of you. And then after that, it'll make you act ridiculous to what you used to act. Why, you know, when people get right with God, never meets God anywhere, they act ridiculous to what the old life was. Paul said, the life I once lived, and the life I now live, it's a different one than one he did live at one time. 
Look at Moses when he met God. He just had all kind of theologies. He's just as full of it as much as Carter has keys. But what happened? When he met God, he was afraid to go down in Egypt. But the next morning we find him with his wife, sitting straddle a mule with a young and on her hip, beard hanging down about like this, an old crooked stick in his hand, just appraising God going down to Egypt. Wasn't that ridiculous looking? Someone say, Moses, where are you going, Father Moses? <laughs> Rabbi Moses, where are you going? <laughs> What's the matter with you, boy? Going down to Egypt to take over. Going right down to take over. One man invasion. Just like one man going over to take over Russia. Well, it sounds ridiculous. But he was just happy. That bald head is shining. That hair going back over his whiskers. Going down. Take over. Why? God said so. And the beauty part of it was he did it. Amen. That's what's the matter of the church nowadays. You've got to let God take over and get all the other stuff out. Take, let God get a hold of you. Take all the knowledge you got in your head out and lay it over one side and let God come into heart. He'll make something out of you. Make you act different. Be different. And your associates will be different. All your whole life will be different. Everything will be changed when God comes into your life. That's as certain as I know about Him. It'll change your life. Now, when God got ready to try out His toxin, did you notice He never put it in a guinea pig? <laughs> he put it in Himself. Any good doctor tries out his own medicine on himself first. Now, God took it out upon Himself. When God was made flesh and dwelt among us, and the life of Christ Jesus being His Son, and God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, He took the toxin upon Himself. When he was baptized by John on the river of Jordan, John bare record seeing the Spirit of God like a dove coming from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It went into him. The disciples and all watched him to see what he would do. They watched his life to see how he would act, to see what would take place. We find him like right when he's under temptation. The toxin helped. When he was in the, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, toxin helped. When he was spit on in his face, toxin hell. When he nailed him to the cross, the toxin hell. It was good. They found out it was good. They seen it would keep him. When he died at the cross and they buried him in the ground on the third morning, now what's going to take place? There he is. He's dead. He's buried. Hid beneath a big rock where a sentry man rolled up all, rolled a stone over to hold him down. Now what's going to happen? A, a guard stood at the door, a hundred men watching him. What's going to take place? He prophesied through the Word of God and said that on the third day he'd rise up again. They made the guard sure. Now what about the top scene? That Easter morning about daybreak, there come an angel down from heaven, rolled away the stone, and the toxin helped in the time of death. The toxin helped because it was God's Word. God's promise that it was a toxin that he'd give the bomb in Gilead. Sure. Now we find out when he rose up on Easter morning, he appeared to many of them begin to show that after the resurrection, the toxin was still the same. It did the same works it did before he died. It still helped. There have become 120 people interested in getting inoculated. <clears throat> I wish all the world would become interested tonight in becoming inoculated because they see it Held in the time of temptation. It kept him from sinning. It held him in temptation. When he was riled up on, he riled out back. It held him in death. And when he died, went in the grave, it helped in the resurrection to come forth again. I like that toxin, don't you? I think that's a good cure. <clears throat> 120 wanted to be inoculated. So they asked him, what can we do? To just stop preaching now, lay down your credentials and things. I want you to go up there in the city of Jerusalem and uh, I'm going to inoculate the whole bunch of you. <laughs> Keep you away from it. Oh, my. They went up there and waited a long time. About ten days is all up there getting all the religions out of them and they get all the differences and everything. And finally there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, clove and tongues set up on them like fire and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them others. They were simply inoculated, brother. I'm telling you, they sealed their life with that inoculation. 
They were shouting and screaming. And listen, my sister, and if it happened to be a Catholic person, close. You pray to Mary, but did you know Mary, being the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet she could not go into heaven until first she got up there and got that inoculation? She sure did. She had to have the same. How are you going to get there anything less than that? See? If Mary had to go up and receive the Holy Ghost, she got so full of the Spirit till she danced in the Spirit and acted like she was drunk. The people on the outside, the critics that had not yet been inoculated yet, said, well, these men are full of new wine. Thought they were dancing and screaming and speaking in other tongues. They said, these are full of new wine. Well, then the first thing you know, they begin to find out they were talking their language. God began to give them the interpretation. They could understand what it was. And they said, we hear the wonderful works of God. What meaneth this? Amen. That startled the country then. Startled the world. It ought to startle the world again. What meaneth this? What's this all about? And Peter stood up and began to preach. And when he did, they said, now wait a minute. They said, we want this thing that will raise up the dead. We want this thing that we can speak in our, another language that we don't know anything about. We want something we can missionary the world by. We want this power of boldness. The trouble it is today, they don't want it. What is this you got? It's a bomb that's in Gilead. It's a, it's a toxin. He said, have you got any more? I said, yeah, we got, we got plenty. We got a doctor here. <clears throat> got a doctor? Yes, we got doctors. What's his name? Dr. Simon Peter. That was a doctor. He used to say, got up and he began to give him the prescription. And when he got through preaching, began to put the word down there and showing him that just exactly what Joel said, what all the prophets had said, this is that, this is that, this is that. Yes. They begin to see the word of God coming together. They said, say, Dr. Simon Peter, what can we do to get inoculated? <laughs> Peter said, no need me right now four or five prescriptions. I'll just write out one for you and your children and your children's children. Them as far off, even as the Lord our God shall call. He said, it won't do to write anymore. I'll just write one eternal prescription for it. He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall be inoculated for the promises unto you and to your children and to them as far off, even as the Lord our God shall call. Yes, brother, we've got bomb in Gilead. we got doctors. Then why is the people in the condition they are today? Is because they refuse to take it, that's all. we got doctors. we got the prescription. we got the toxin that kills sin, that heals a body, that makes a new creature in Christ Jesus. But it's the people that don't want to take it. They don't want the price. Now, don't you never mess with a doctor's prescription. Brother, when they study that prescription out, they put just so much poison in there, then enough antidote. If you put uh, too much antidote, it won't do your patient no good. If you keep put too much poison in, it'll kill your patient. Now, if, you're, if the doctor writes out a prescription, you better take it to the right kind of a pharmacy that'll fill it out right, or you could get killed by it. Amen. That's what's the trouble today. You've got too many quack pharmacists around. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Fill it out the way it was wrote. Just the way he wrote it, that's the way to keep it. That's what he said to do. So that's what's the matter too many dead children, too many dead churches. It's because they don't want that baptism of the Holy Ghost no more. They don't want it. They want to add something instead of shake the preacher's hand or something other, become a deacon or, or sing in the choir or do something else like that to take its place. Those things are all right. But brother, it ain't the it ain't the toxin. God's Holy Spirit is a toxin. Yes, sir. And it makes a new creature out of you. It makes a new person out of you. It straightens you up and makes you what you ought to be. It makes your character different. What's the matter with our churches today? Why do your race of people, larger race, have your slaves to work? Old Abraham Lincoln took off that hat and stuck it under his arm and said, That's wrong. That's wrong. That man's a human being. He's not a horse. So he said, by the help of God, I'll hit it someday if it takes my life. You're not long ago, I was standing in a museum. An old colored man, just a little rim of white hair, was going along there looking for something. He looked over that glass, and seen that he jumped back, shut his eyes, the tears getting running down his old wrinkled cheeks. He was praying. 
I watched him for a little bit. After a while, I walked over to him. I said, how do you do, uncle? He said, how do you do, sir? And I said, um, I noticed you're praying. I said, I'm a minister. I just wonder what excited you. He said, come here. And looked over there. I said, I don't see nothing. Just a dress. He said, but did you see that stain on there? He said, that is the blood of Abraham Lincoln. He said, and right here on my side is the marks of the slave belt. He said, that blood took the mark, took that slave belt off of me. And said, if that, I thought if a, a, a man that had a slave belt on him and the blood of Abraham Lincoln took the slave belt off him, what ought the blood of Jesus Christ do to a born again church that what it took the slave belts of sin off of us and brought us into the kingdom of God and took all the evil stuff away from us and inoculated us and give us of his blessings and of his power that we might live the life of Jesus Christ and not be associated anymore with the things of the world. Oh my, what a difference it ought to make with every one of us. But the thing of it is we don't want it. <laughs> we don't want to we don't want to fool with it. We're we're tired of it. Certainly. little boy, the epilepsy. I suppose they had him here to be prayed for. Is that right, sister? All right. You believe with me now. Satan, leave that child. Come out of him in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you interrupt my message, Satan? You evil thing, come out of that child. I adjure thee by the living God. Pass from him. Now, there it is. All right. Now, I'll continue on. Now, as we was down in the south and watching the, the slaves, they come by one day to get a, buy slaves. They would buy them because that they were, uh, trade them from one to another. And one time they'd have to beat them slaves sometime and make them work because they were homesick and away from their home. And you know what happened one day? A buyer come by like a broker and was going to buy a slave. And when he noticed out there, he said, How many slaves you got? He said, About 150. He went out to look at him, and all that bunch of slaves out there. And he said, They noticed all of them weary, but one young man. Brother, they didn't have to whip him. He had his chest out, chin up, right about the business. And that buyer said, I want to buy him. He said, Oh, no, said the owner. He's not for sale. So. said, well, why? I said, he, he's different from the rest of them. said, uh, is he a boss? He said, no, he's a slave. said, do you feed him different? Do you do the rest of them? He said, no. He eats out in the galley with the rest of the slaves. He said, then what makes him so much different than the rest of them? He said, I wondered once myself what made him different. He said, I found out that over in the homeland where they came from, his father is the king of the tribe. And though he's away from home, yet he knows his father is a king, so he conducts himself like a king's son. Oh, what a lesson that ought to be for us. Women, stop cutting your hair. Start living like Christian women. Man, quit the things that you're doing. The Christian church should conduct itself like sons and daughters of the king, living godly in this present world. You believe that? Let us bow our heads just a moment now. Would there be someone here that does not know Christ as their Savior and would like to be a, to receive this balm in Gilead? I'll tell you, doctor's medicine sometimes, if you fail to take it, you might die. And again, you might get well, but there's one thing, sure. If you refuse this balm of Gilead, God's medicine for sin, you're sure to die. You're just going to die. And remember, it's not just for one and then not for the other. It's for whosoever will may come and drink from the waters, the fountains of the waters of life freely. If you'd like to be remembered in closing prayer, would you raise up your hand and say, Remember me, Brother Branham. I want to be remembered. God bless you. God bless you. And you, you, and you. Many around here. Ah, oh, that's fine. That's good. Now, sister, to you with this little boy here. 
You believe with all your heart, and you'll never have another one. Aren't you believe? That he snapped out of it just that second, you see. God took it off of him. When he was beating his little face and trying to get him to wake up, feel better, sonny? Now you'll be all right. Just believe it, it'll never come again. God, who art can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Christ, the great healer, the great physician, is near. The, if there is a bomb in Gilead for the sin sick soul, there's a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Would you come now while we have our heads bowed? You that does not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, does not know Christ as your Savior, would you come up here and stand here? Let's pray together before we change the order of the meeting. You can go right back to your seat if you'll just come up. How many would like to say this? I'm coming, Brother Bram. God bless you, lady. God bless you, young man. That's it. God bless you, sir. That's right. Come right around here. The same God could heal that little boy with epilepsy can take away sins. Of course he can. See? Will you come? Give us a card on the organ. There is a fountain filled with blood, if you will. Draw from Emmanuel's veins. Come stand right around the altar here, will you now, while we pray? There is a fountain filled with blood on from Emmanuel. You without the Holy Spirit now that wants the baptism, will you come now? Come stand around the altar. Stand here in his presence. Just stand here for a few minutes. Let us have prayer with you. You can go right back to your seat. Their guilty stains look all their guilty stains. I want to ask you, there is a bomb in Gilead. There's a physician here of the great Holy Spirit. Will you come? Now, what are you going to do? God's going to ask you if you haven't received him. When you go out the door, maybe before morning, maybe the end of your time on earth. You may never live to get home. Then God's going to say, why? Why didn't you? There was a bomb in Gilead. The Holy Spirit here. If you fall in weak, lukewarm in your experience, you'd like to be renewed again. David said, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He had not lost his salvation, but he lost all the joy. I think that goes to about 95% of the church today. Losing the joy of their salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. While these people are here praying, would you like to come up and re- get your joy restored? The joy of your salvation? That God might renew the blessings in your heart, be full of His Spirit and goodness. Come stand around the altar. Let's just come up and renew our vows to God. <laughs> That's good. Sinner friend, come with them. Backslider doesn't know God, come with them. Sick or afflicted, come with them. There is a bomb in Gilead. Oh. Oh, my. Homesick children wanting to go home. That's it.
just raise up your hand and say, Lord, I'm here to do you. I'm here to be filled with your spirit. There is a bomb now. There's a position here. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to you these people. May the Holy Ghost come upon them now, Lord. They're your waiting. They, they know the time is running out. Just a little while and time will be no more. And the church is supposed to go to sleep and go into the lady of the age. God, may it not be so with this group. May they be filled with the Holy Ghost tonight. May you forgive these sinners their sins. Heal the sick and afflicted here, Lord. May this be a great hour for them as we're waiting, Lord. Looking at Calvary, where there is a fountain that's filled with blood. Rain it. Rain it to us. Fill us with our spirit as we wait. <laughs> now just don't turn loose. Take a hold. Just hold on to Calvary. I go ever satisfied. Every potion that God comes is satisfied. That's right. Get right down to business. When you get to business, God will get to business. It'll be up to you now. It's one of your promises to you.
believe on him, my brother, with all your heart. Close your eyes now. There is a fountain filled with blood. There's blood beneath that blood that you found. There's all there will be. Someday he's coming. Someday we got to meet him, friend, every one of us. Now, if you was here that, that's repenting of your sin, and come up to the altar to be forgiven, remember, I'm quoting you the word of the Lord. Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. See, God spoke to you. Then all the Father hath given me will come to me. See, he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. We know that's the Scripture. That's what Jesus said. Now you got to base your faith right there. See, he promised it. He can't lie. Now look, St. John 5.24, think of it. A handful and two dozen eggs. 5.24, St. John 5.24. He that heareth my word, that's what I was preaching, and believeth on him that sent me, hath present in everlasting life and shall never come into the judgment but has half passed in passed from death unto life because you believed on him how are we saved by faith by faith are you saved that by the grace of God now you that's standing here to accept Christ as your Savior know that it was God when you raised your hand back there you broke every scientific rule you know science According to science, you can't move your hands. They're hanging down. See, you break gravitation. The laws of gravitation cause your hands hanging down. And actually, the world, if it was that, well, then if you could just at leisure, your hands would go up like that, then your feet wouldn't stay on the ground. You're just going out in space. But what did you do when you raised up your hand? What did you do when you walked up here? You defied the laws of gravitation. Why? You raised up your hand towards your maker because something spoke to your heart. Then you got a spirit in there. That spirit made a decision. Yes, sir. I want Jesus Christ as my Savior. Raised up my hand. That defied every law of gravitation right there. A spirit in you, a spirit by you spoke in you and said, you want Christ for your Savior. You raised up your hand. Now watch how simple. Now, he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before the Father and the holy angel. He that heareth my word and believeth on him and sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment done pass from death unto life you have eternal life because you have believed now upon the basis of it's not no sensation see sensations won't work see I've had I've had sensations sometime but I feel so bad I didn't know whether I was even a servant of God or not but it ain't that it's a word Jesus defeated the devil on the word of God see that's where it, it ain't how I feel it's what I believe he never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? you got to have faith. Any kind of Buddhist has sensations. I've seen, I've seen them get around, drink blood out of a human skull, and have all kinds of sensations and call on devils in Africa. They had sensations. I've sat in the camps and they had the bull snake dance and screamed and carried on. That's sensation. But that goes too. That's a, that's a perverb of the kingdom of God. Everything the devil's got, he had to copy it off of God. See? What is, what is unrighteousness? It's righteousness perverted. What is a lie is a truth misrepresented. What is a what is a bad woman that's a good woman that's been fouled? See? That's exactly the devil can't create nothing. He's no creator. He perverts what's already been created. So God's word is creative. And it is a creation. The creation of the word of God. 
And when you accept it in your heart, it creates a new creature. You believe it. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, upon the basis of something speaking to you that you wanted to be saved, something spoke to you to come to the altar. You did it. Now you confess your sins. Lord, I'm wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I want to be right. I want you to forgive me. Now he said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. When you're raised from your seat, you're already forgiven. See? Now can you accept him now? Nothing on what you've done. All you've done is forgotten. Upon the basis of his promise and his spirit led you to the altar, do you accept him as your Savior? Raise up your hands. If you say, I'll accept him as my Savior. God bless you. Now, the next thing you must do now, you have already saved. He that will confess me before man, I'll confess him before the Father. If you're ashamed of me here, I'll be ashamed of you at the judgment. Now, you're Christians now. The next thing you want to do is be baptized and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's God's Word. Is that right, minister? That's as plain as it can be made. Never, don't, now don't let the devil tell you, well, I feel bad. I feel bad a lot of times. I don't have nothing to do with it. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. See, because I know there's a blessing laying ahead and Satan's trying to get me away from it. I just keep going on anyhow. See? Just keep moving on. Now, to you people that wanted to renew the joy of your salvation, and to you that somewhere you've lost joy, think back what you did. Did you neglect prayer meeting? Neglect reading the Bible? Did ne- neglect the praying at your home? Asking a blessing at the table? Don't never do that. Oh, my, that's so... That's so unbecoming to Christians. No matter where you are, bow your head and pray. Don't be ashamed of him. Pray anywhere. See? And if ever where you left that joy at, whatever weeded it out, what little root of bitterness come in. Remember, when a man's saved, this much, like this button here, <coughs> becomes eternal light in your heart. That's God. As you're able to push out all the roots of bitterness, then God begins to spread in you. Then you become a son of God. A man was made to be God, to be a God. Did you know that? He's an image of God. He's the Son of God. He's like Him. He was given a domain. Genesis 1, 26. Dominion over the whole earth. That's right. He ruled the earth. He ruled the animal kingdom and all the other kingdoms. All but the kingdom of God above. He was God. He was an amateur God. He was made in the image of God. Made like God. Had hands and feet like God. He was in the image of God. What happened? The, because he disbelieved God's Word... It sent him right back out to shift for himself. Now God's trying to bring him back. And when you have faith and accept him, my brother, just let that little light begin to grow out, taking all the roots of doubt and bitterness, yielding yourself to the Spirit. Then you begin to become a son of God, a daughter of God, begin to grow in the grace of God. The Holy Spirit begins to build its kingdom within you. Now, if you've grieved that Spirit somewhere, then go right back and think to your mind, what did I start doing? Neglecting church? Did I start fussing with another denomination? Did I start picking on this one? Doing this to my neighbor? If you did, that's what sapped it out. Go say, God, I'm sorry. I'll go right back and make that thing right. I'll go right and do it. Then the joy will come back to your salvation again. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just flew right up on the, on the rafter. He's ready to fly right back down again anytime you want, to, want him to come back. He does the leading. The dove leads the da- lamb. We know that. Now, to you that's sick and afflicted, you that needs prayer for your bodies. If you need prayer for your body, he's your healer. How do I get it, Brother Branham? Well, here's how you get it, by believing. Everything that God could ever do for you, he did it at Calvary in Christ. Do you believe that? Amen. Jesus said it's finished. You say, Brother Branham, did he save me then? Certainly. I beg your pardon. I was just saved five minutes ago. No, no. You were saved 1,900 years ago. You just accepted it five minutes ago. That's how he... You accepted it. Just like I say, here's the Bible, take it. You just let it there, there, it's yours, but you've got to take it first. You've got to accept it. When you accept it, there's nothing you can do. You can't merit one thing. If my tie was crooked, and I say, here, I'm going to give you a million dollars, you say, I'll straighten up your tie. There you are, Brother Branham. I'll give you that because you give me a million dollars. Then I'll never give you a million dollars. See? You've done something to earn it. So it's not a thing you can do to earn it. You just have to accept it. That's the same thing about divine healing. You know, to, I see people get all worked up and try to get nervous and say, oh, if I could just, you know, why well, you go plumb over the top of it. You leave it behind you. Going out there excited and trying to reach for something when it's right, you're by you. Just simple. Just say, thank you, Father. You promised it to me. I now receive it. That's all. Watch what happened. 
I mean it in your heart. Just keep saying it over and over. Say, if you don't believe it all together, keep saying it till you do believe it. Just keep saying it over. I thank you, Lord, for my healing. Well, what is he? Christ is the high priest of our confession. Is that right? Yes. Hebrews 3. Or he's a high priest of our confession. Then he cannot do one thing for you. can make no intercession until first you confess that it's done. Uh, is that scriptural? High priest of our confession. And he can only act when we confess. Now, if you say, Lord, I lost the joy in my salvation. I want you. I'm sorry I stayed away from prayer meeting. Wednesday night will find me right back or Tuesday, whenever it is. I'll be right back. All right? Mean that. Believe it. Say, I've confessed I'm wrong. Now, start working on it. Christ starts interceding for you. Then say, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned, Lord. I'm going to be a Christian from now on. Then see, you made your confession. Start right on with it. If you're sick, say, Lord, you are my healer. If I've sinned, the cause has come up on me. Forgive me. Lord, I'm taking you at your word. You said you'd heal me. I believe it. You're the high priest of my confession. Now, I'm confessing it. By your stripes, I was healed. Thank you, Lord. Go right on. See, then he can go to work on it and start healing you. See what I mean? Here's some time ago. People not instructed. Hardly knows how to do it. A woman of the... Her husband runs a four rolls whiskey there in Louisville. The biggest distilleries. He's a president there. And he, she come running over to the meeting one night. Her daughter come. And, and she was going to be operated on with a, a, a real bad case of gallbladder like a cancer or something on the gallbladder. Oh, she was so excited. She run in. She didn't want to wait for me. He's, oh, no, pray for me. Pray for me. I just can't wait. My husband's coming after me. You don't want me over here. Well, he just had to lay hands on her and let her go. About three or four nights after that, she said, I feel better. Called up the doctor. And the doctor said, well... That's just, she's just excited. She'll, she'll get over that. And she wouldn't permit the operation. So then finally the doctor said, well, just let her go then. Said, well, if she won't accept it now, I won't operate on her no matter when it comes back on her. In a few days, she began to feel sick again. She got all nervous. She called up the doctor. And she said, oh, of course, there's a big lot of money in it. So he accepted the operation. And a doctor friend of mine stood in the operation. And they opened the woman up and... The thing is already gone. See? It was gone. She had the operation for nothing. A one of my very personal friends said they sold it up. There was nothing we could do. The thing is done gone. Well, see, she just wasn't instructed enough to know how to hold on to God. Well, you got when you accept God for anything, you stay right there with it. <laughs> It'll bring you through. Just stay with that word. His promise. Don't you believe that? Amen. 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 I believe if we need healing, we need our restoring our salvation. What did Jesus say? Now, this is his word. These signs shall follow them that believe. Is that right? Amen. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that right? Amen. How many in here is believers? Raise up your hand. All right. Now, let's, now let's tell you what let's do. If you believe that now, I just, please, church, here's just what I hope Brother Outlaw forgives me for this. But look, here's what's the matter with this tabernacle. It's what's the matter with every tabernacle. All of them today, you're getting away from that. See, it's just been such a fuss and a carry on amongst the people that they just got gross. I feel so sorry for them. See? They'll stand and say, I wish I could take a hold of it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. In the next ten minutes, it's all faded away. See, now that's exactly what the Bible said would take place in the last days. Be a lukewarm. He said, I would you're either cold or hot. See? If you're going to believe God, believe Him. If he's God believing, he isn't. Well, I just walk away and leave it alone. See, you're you're trying to act like something that you're not. Then, as Congressman Upshaw said, you can't be nothing that you ain't, and that's true. See, you you've got to be what you are. So, in your heart, if you truly can believe that I am a believer, I do believe God. Well, if I believe God, I have an eat, and I accept it right now. And that settles it. Don't say no more about it. Just keep on praising God. That's how I got healed. Satan said, you're not healed. You're not a bit different. I said, stick around. If you want to hear me testify, you just hang around. That's all you have to do. I'll sure burn your ears every day. He called. I'm going to sing his praises as loud as I can. And he left me. Exactly. There's Mrs. Waldroff standing back there. They pulled her in my meeting. We're going to first come to Phoenix with a cancer dead. Right. The doctors brought the testimony of that cancer condition in the x-rays. There she stands. That's been about how many? About fifteen years ago. Fourteen. 
14 years ago. There she lived. And why? God's God. Amen. Same God was with the sins, the same God now. Amen. There is a bomb in Gilead. Amen. There's a physician here. The physician said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now you lay your hands on somebody. Don't you pray for yourself now. You pray for them, they're going to be praying for you. Lay your hands on one another. Just stretch your hands across if you have need. Pray for somebody, somebody pray for you. There is a bomb in Gilead. There's a physician there. Right. Now, pray for one another just the way you do at your church. These signs shall follow them that believe. health not recovered. And I, the thought of that, is there no bomb in Gilead? We have plenty of bombs. We have physicians, that's true. And usually when we were hunting uh, toxins, there was a time when there was no toxins for smallpox. There was no toxins for, uh, for the polio. But we have those toxins now, and they're, they're great. We appreciate them. And then I thought, how do you find a toxin? Where you find a toxin, doctors usually and scientists and research, they, they find some kind of a chemical and then try it on a guinea pig and see if the guinea pig can survive it, then they get it to you. And sometimes those toxins, are, they won't work on all people because all people maybe not be the same kind of condition of a body that that guinea pig is, so it wouldn't work right. <clears throat> but you know, God has a toxin. And... Uh, he, uh, he ever tried on a guinea pig, he put it on his tongue, and it held. It held in the hours of sensation, it held a Calvary, and it proved to be right on Easter morning. There was 120 people that desired that toxin. So they went up to the day of Pentecost, up in the upper room, and they were everyone inoculated with that, with that uh, toxin. And so then when the sick people began to ask, is there any, what must we do? Peter wrote him a prescription, and that prescription is uh, an eternal prescription. He said, because this prescription will last for you and your children, your children's children, and then it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, now, if a doctor writes a prescription, now, as the way I understand, there's enough poison in there to poison the germ that's in the body, and he has to diagnose how strong that body is before it he can give them or fix his prescription. Now, if you take too much of that toxin and not enough antidote to upset it, it'll kill the patient. And then if you put too much of the antidote in and not enough toxin, it don't do the patient any good. And I think that's what's been the matter around until this little group here raised up. We had denomination barriers. We could just get over just so far as our... Baptists or Presbyterian denominations to let us go. But in this, we went right back to the original prescription. Got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and just spread the vows everywhere, you see. And there's plenty of, of toxin left, and it's, it's diagnosed out just exactly the way Dr. Simon Peters had doc, uh, diagnosed it out. And if we'll just take it according to the prescription, repentance, not shaking hands, repentance first, you see, getting right with God. It'll take the same effect upon us that it did upon them, and it'll bring forth the same kind of a ministry. Yeah. It proves it to this young fellow just testified here that it, this is the message of the hour. I believe is Pentecostal message, Pentecostal grace. And why would we fool with anything else 
when the skies are full of the real. See? So we can take the real thing and get the, the real Pentecostal blessing. And I think that's what the world is hungering for. I, a few days ago, we, I'm not Democrat nor Republican. I'm a Christian. So I don't mention these things, but I picked up a, a, it's an old book there that uh, the Lord had gave me a vision in 1933 when I was just first... Uh, become a minister, going down to the Baptist Tabernacle. And he gave me a vision that morning, and I, I seen the uh, first one I remember of the international affair, and I seen that President Roosevelt that was in then, and seen that we'd go to a world war. Then I seen also that that's 11 years before the Maginot Line was built, I seen Germany fortify themselves in this big concrete place. I also seen they permitted women to vote, which was wrong, and said they would they would someday elect the wrong man. They just did it, and then so then I seen the time of of the end coming, and five things that the Lord let seven things I saw, five of them has already come to pass. I seen a powerful woman stand up in the United States. You can write this down if you want. This is going to happen. I don't know. If she's on the road now. Exactly. And she took over, and then I seen the United States just like uh, something that's burned over, hit it, and just stumped and brought up rocks and things. And then I seen the time that there'd be an increase in science. I noticed there'd be an automobile. I had it low down there. I got it right with me now. Uh, old yellow paper. That there'd be a machine, automobile, perfected, looked like an egg, and be glass over it. And there was a man and woman, uh, the family sitting there with their backs turned to one another, playing cards. And the machine traveled itself, something on the bumpers that would, they couldn't hit the others. Going down, and I've seen that on television a few nights ago. They got that thing perfected right now. See? All those things that the Lord spoke is true. And we just got two more things left for that be fulfilled, and that's the end time. And if there ever was a time that we ought to be trying to get people to God, it's now. And I think testimonies like the young man here and Brother Terrell and Obey. No matter some people say, well, the Spirit didn't feel right. It don't make any difference. It'll feel right if you'll take your place. Maybe you were supposed to raise it up to that place. See, if he obeyed God, prayed God, and then when the man came in, he gave him the testimony that really done the work. And I'm so glad today to be among you. And, and as I see my years fading out and seeing young fellows like that coming on, to, if there is a tomorrow, they'll take the gospel tomorrow. I'll be seeing you tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock, the Lord willing. The Lord bless you. It didn't even take much time, but...